Welcome to the Sports Size Podcast. I'm Dr. Ashley Bassett. And I'm Dr. Katherine Logan. On each episode, we chat about the most recent developments in sports medicine and dissect through all the noise so you know which literature should actually impact your practice. Today, we're continuing our special series of episodes to recap the newest research presented at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons annual meeting, our largest orthopedic conference. This year, over 20,000 orthopedic professionals gathered at the AOS annual meeting in San Francisco to take part. On this episode, we are recapping some of the standout posters presented at AOS with Dr. Megan Bishop. If you haven't listened to our last mini episode, what are you waiting for? Go check it out and hear all about the AOS meeting. But today, we're just going to dive right in. If you're looking for a trusted name in osteochondral allograft transplantation, look no further than JRF Ortho. With a stellar track record and a reputation as the leader in fresh osteochondral allografts, JRF Ortho is here to elevate your practice to new heights. JRF Ortho has proudly distributed over 25,000 allografts worldwide, making a significant impact in the field. Their passion for this industry goes beyond the numbers. It's about helping patients and fulfilling their mission of improving people's quality of life. But that's not all. At JRF Ortho, they understand that superior customer care is crucial. They aim to give you one less thing to think about so you can focus on what matters the most, your patients. And they make ordering JRF Ortho easy. They are committed to accommodating your needs and delivering allografts on your terms. You're in control. Choose your scheduling option, whether it's specifying a surgical date, providing a date range, or just requesting the earliest available allograph. Your preferences are their top priority. So, prepare for success. Order with JR Ortho and take control of your orthopedic journey. Hey, Megan. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Ashley. Hey, Catherine. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be back. Welcome back. So our next poster is a really exciting one. <laughs> it's titled, <laughs> <laughs> sorry if the authors are listening to this, <laughs> it's titled Statistical Fragility of Platelet-Rich Plasma and Lateral Epicondylitis, a Systematic Review and Simulated Fragility Analysis of Randomized Control Trials. So Megan, I don't know if you checked out some of our other episodes, our podcast tries to stay far away from statistical analysis and methodology <laughs> breakdown. But I do think this poster draws attention to an important issue. So in orthopedics, we try to use statistically significant findings defined as those with a p-value of less than 0.5 from level one randomized control trials to guide our clinical decision making. And this poster suggests that that's really not all we should be looking at, particularly as it pertains to PRP for lateral epicondylitis. So this talks about the fragility index and the fragility quotient. Um, So Megan, you do a fair amount of research at Rothman. Is your stats team including a fragility analysis for some of the higher level RCTs? And if not, do you think this is important to consider? Yeah, I mean, so we have not generally included fragility analysis um, in, you know, most of the studies that we've done. You know, that's for the sports department. I'm not sure if like our spine or our joints department are using it. Uh, but generally for sports, we've not been including the fragility analysis. I've seen a lot of papers come out with this recently, kind of mm-hmm. going back through, you know, and, you know, doing um, uh, systematic reviews and things like that, and looking at fragility index and um, things. So, so I, I think it's important that we're starting to analyze our data using this. Um, and it's something that certainly we should consider using in the future. Because, um, like you said, it's not necessarily that simple. There's a lot of factors that go into what is statistically significant, um, especially for something like PRP. Um, so I think that this was a, a good um, index to look at for PRP, which we know there's so much variability in PRP preparations and so much mm-hmm. variability um, in administration of PRP and things like that. So um, sorry, I'm sorry. laughing at Catherine sneezing right now. <laughs> I muted myself in time, but I was like, oh God, it's coming. So sorry. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. So yeah. So um, I, I think, you know, the statistical fragility index is, I don't know much about stats, but it seems like it makes sense. seems like we should probably be including it. And I think looking using, using it to look at PRP, especially for lateral epicondylitis, you know, is mm-hmm. useful because um, there's so much variability in the studies that we see uh, for that. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, sort of, you know, what we're talking about in this study that um, it might limit the reproduci- reproduci- reproducibility, thank you, of the <laughs> study results. So, you know, this analysis was performed at the Mayo Clinic. Um, we had Dr. Aaron um, Critch on our show uh, last year at AOSSM, and he did this study with um, Dr. Christopher Camp. 
And they found that RCTs evaluating the efficacy of PRP injections for the treatment of lateral epicondylitis um, might possess substantial fragility. So I think, you know, we talk about this a lot with just like PRP studies in general. There is a lot, um, you know, it, that limits us in sort of really applying this across the board. Um, and, you know, are we like looking at these outcomes and the decisions that we based um, our clinical decisions on, you know, is there more statistical fragility than we think? Um, so, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Does this like, you know, as far as PRP, like how do you best sort of figure out what's right for you and your practice? Yeah, I think in terms of PRP, and I've like reviewed a number of papers looking at systematic reviews on PRP, and they're always a little hard to get published. Um, yeah. And the fact is that there's just so, like we said, so much variability in administration. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to quantify what's in PRP. Um, like you can obviously have like what the manufacturer says, like, you know, should be in there when you centrifuge, but it's dependent on the patient's, you know, the amount of platelets they have, like a number of things that you really can't ever quantify exactly what you're giving. Um, so, you know, that's been always been a downside uh, of PRP. I mean, I think we have good data looking at like leukocyte rich, uh, going into tendons versus leukocyte poor, which you want to use for joint osteoarthritis and things like that. So, so those preparations, like kind of in general, that we have good data for that. Um, but in terms of, um, kind of specific, more specifics to PRP, I think it's been hard to kind of nail down, um, any exact right preparation and exact right administration, um, and really indications because, you know, you do see a lot of studies that will say, oh, look, it kind of, you know, we found in this one study that it helps for rotator cuff tears, but then you find in like six other studies, it doesn't. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think PRP in my practice, I still do offer it for lateral epicondylitis. Um, I think it's an option I offer patients, but frankly, a lot of patients don't choose to do it, um, because they don't want to pay the money. Uh, you know, I will occasionally offer a cortisone. I usually try to sway patients away from doing cortisone, but some will, knowing the risks and things like that, still want it. Uh, and it's hard to convince a patient to do a thousand dollar PRP injection that you know, maybe has like 60 to 80% efficacy, uh, versus a cortisone injection that, you know, probably will provide them a couple months of relief. So it's probably going to come back afterwards, uh, or even offering them surgery at that point, which is going to be most likely covered mostly by their insurance. So, you know, um, you know, I always do offer PRP in my lateral epicondylitis that are failing conservative management, but I still find that a lot of patients will choose to other things. Yeah. yeah. I think you made a really good point there about the cost, right? Because it's like that out-of-pocket cost. I think when we get better data, for me, that's helpful to maybe be able to push patients. I mean, not like strong arm them into spending their own money, but like, hey, this has a really good chance of helping you. We have high level data that shows that it does. We don't have that now. So for me to tell someone to go spend a thousand dollars of their hard earned money on this, and we don't have that data to back it up, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel great. Right. And also I think we need high level data to get insurance companies to start covering this. Like that's how we're going to get this to ultimately be covered by insurance is high level studies, reproducible studies that show insurances that we need to be doing this for various orthopedic conditions. So I think it's as boring as stats is. <laughs> I do think it's important to yield really good, you know, high quality um, data that we can use to kind of advocate for our patients. Yeah. And we, you know, talk about this a lot. Every time we talk about PRP or biologics, it's just that like a big part is the education and it's sort of this like poster almost adds to our education of saying like, Hey, you know, this is an option for you, but really what we know about it is limited, you know, and we're sort of seeing trends and, you know, things that we say, okay, this is trending in the right direction or the data is emerging, but I can't confidently look you in the eye and say, oh, this is guaranteed to sort of make you better, you know, uh, based on, you know, you and your makeup or like, um, you know, the preparation or the centrifuge that I'm using or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, whether or not you've taken Advil in the last five days, there's so many other little things that, you know, I think it just makes us sort of temper, um, uh, you know, what we're like the expectations that we're setting. So in, in that way, it's like helpful data to just sort of say like, yeah, we're still not there yet. We're, you know, getting better all the time, but you know, it, it really is like more emerging evidence as opposed to like, you know, hard and true. Do you guys send, usually send your patients or do it yourself, ultra, do it under ultrasound guidance for these injections? 
uh, or do you just kind of find the you know, ma- point of maximal tenderness and inject? These so I do I'm, under ultrasound. Yeah. Ashley, I feel like someone in your office does them. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know yeah. you did ultrasound. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so yes, not, we have not, everything. Off, not yeah. but just for that. To, I mean, I guess you could find the hypoechoic area yeah. and like guide it into yeah. that that defect. Um, so we have a non-operative uh, sports doctor that does all of our um, PRP, all of our 10Xs, um, all of our lipogems. And so he, um, so I'll send to him for a 10X plus or minus PRP consult. Um, and he'll talk to them about the risks and benefits of both of those options for um, epicondylitis and then come to a decision and go from there. That's great. Yeah, that's that's similar. I, we have a non-operative um, sports talks as well that do ultrasound guided injections. So I usually feel like, you know, in, in turn, I feel a little bit better sending a patient to have it done under ultrasound guidance when, just to make sure that it's in an exact right spot, you know, when they're paying all that money and things like that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's been a, many studies that show outcomes that, that are different, you know, between ultrasound guided versus non-ultrasound guided. I'm sure there is stuff out there on that. Um, but it, it, you know, it makes sense to me to have it, the area exactly visualized and things like that. Agree. Thank you for listening to this episode of the sports docs. We hope you enjoyed our discussion as much as we did. Make sure to subscribe on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Amazon music, and YouTube to stay up to date on all things sports medicine. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review. We also love to see your comments and hear about your questions. You can reach us by email at sportsdocspod at gmail.com. Or find us on Instagram at the Sports Docs Pod and Twitter at the Sports Doc Pod. We love your feedback.